I promised some people when the weather got better or when I came to Texas, I would nap some obsidian. So here I am in Texas with the weather a lot warmer. So I grabbed some obsidian from my landscaping in my yard. Uh, I think this is, well, let's see. I'll, I'll see in a minute here. Hold on. Yeah, this particular stuff I think is silver sheen obsidian. Let's see. I grabbed another piece. I think this, this one might be better. Oops. Yeah, this is looks like black dacite. I'd rather nap the dacite than the obsidian for what I'm going to make. Uh, but we'll see. If I end up breaking this with because I'm using way too much force, I'll have to use the silver sheen or looking type stuff. Let's see if I can spall some off of this. Some, some off of this nodule that might be of the correct size. Now the reason why I don't nap obsidian in the cold weather is because I don't want to nap in a very enclosed area. I want to have some space because these chips will fly. They fly further than the flint. So I wait until I have more space. Okay. Totally different ball game than the flint and chert I've been working with. It's extremely brittle. Good thing is obsidian is cheap. Now, do I work with the same tools? Yep. Everything's the same. Same tools. I probably could use one of these pieces just so, to show you how I deal with this very fragile stuff. Because this, this stuff is actually excellent. You know, this black dacite is very, very nice to nap. But this silver sheen type stuff is very difficult. Plus, it has pockets of ash in it. So this might be more useful for you to see. I tossed those other two little pieces. Tossed them in the trash. Because... The only time I nap this stuff is on video. I don't like napping this particular type of stuff because it'll just break without warning because it has internal flaws and it's extremely brittle as it is. Just the material itself, the uh, Obsidian itself is extremely brittle. It has no flexibility. So not all obsidian is created equal. Now in the Southwest, the Native Americans made points out of this stuff. Uh, this, out of uh, chunks this small. They made really small arrowheads. And I think a lot of this obsidian was transported from the, you know, from very large distances as flakes that were napped in campsites. You, 
can pack in quite a few flakes. And they are useful later, even of that size, you can nap tiny arrowheads that are very useful. They work, especially because of the extreme sharpness. Now with obsidian and dacite and the related materials, glass, you, you'll see me brush a lot of this off because the, uh, the flakes get between my forearm and my pant leg and they start cutting up my arms in this area underneath. So that's what I'm doing. For those of you who are new. All right, so this preform is a little bit large for what I want to do, but oh well. It'll be a good exercise. It'll be a good exercise in showing you what I do. Mostly it's just being very careful. Choosing my opportunities very carefully. More carefully than with stone, with a flint or chert. Yep, a little more careful. Because hitting on the base and hitting on the tip is more dangerous in terms of risk of breaking than with flint or chert. Unless you're dealing with a very delicate heat treat. Now, I mentioned something in one of my other videos that I'm, I'm getting more of, the f more of the feeling that Native Americans had specialized toolkits for certain types of points because it's better for production if you have a toolkit designed specifically for the types of points you want to make instead of having a generic set like I have. They can make almost anything. You know, if you if you know the points you're going to make, you're going to you're going to favor tools that are easy to use with the type of point you're making. You'll get to know which ones are easy to use compared to others. And, you know, it depends on the material you're working with as well. So if you, you know, it's not unreasonable to assume that Native Americans found their favorite stuff and they would stick with it their whole life. And they would go to great lengths to obtain it. You know, because it's their favorite stuff. And they always use it. They heat treat it, maybe. Uh, and they, they don't want to experiment if they don't have to. They get used to using the same material, the same tools. I think that's a reasonable assumption. Modern nappers are expected to be able to nap various types of points, or they're not taken seriously. All right? But back in the day, you just had to specialize in one or two, maybe three different types. And that's it. So, in that case, with a specialized toolkit, it's easier to teach someone because they're all using the same toolkit. Now, I'm a big advocate of saying that not everyone used the same toolkit, but as you gain more experience, uh, as a flint napper, uh, back in the day, as the flint nappers back in the day gained more experience, 
and wanted to teach the younger generation, they would probably insist on the new novices procuring certain materials for their tools. You got to use this type of uh, bone for this operation, this type of antler for this reduction stage, uh, and develop a consistent toolkit rather than everyone being all chaotic. Although I think it, the chaos also existed. But if I were to specialize, just as my own personal anecdote, if I was to specialize in a certain point type with a certain type of material, I would ki kind of imagine, or I would imagine that the toolkit would be specialized and predictable and duplicatable for the majority of nappers some of them are going to want to go out on their own and do their own thing that's what you always have those and you don't even though experience both today and back in the day would lead you to believe that they specialized with their tools I think that you can't say positively absolutely that's what they did they might not have the reason I say that is there's a lot of independent thinking in the Native American lifestyle you can see that by the different the many different cultures and languages even within the same tribes certain tribes were just groups of people uh, loosely held together by certain traditions but they had a lot of their own independent ways of doing things So there's pros and cons, or there's evidence for and against standardized toolkits. Standardized toolkits, there's evidence for and against standardized napping toolkits. The, the uh, arguments in favor of a standardized toolkit, you're only dealing one, you're only dealing with one or two different point types. Two, experience causes you to specialize. And three, it's much easier to teach if everyone's using the same things. Much easier to teach. The arguments against standardized toolkits, uh, the cultures, were highly independent from each other in many cases. Materials are not always easy to find, so you just use what you have. Some guys would have antlers, some guys would have bones, some guys would have horn. It just all depends on what they have available and what their dog did not eat. You know? It's not like we have today where you want some certain material you just buy that certain material Every, everything is available all the time in our modern society but back in the day it was not so that's one argument against a standardized toolkit so you make your own decisions Look for data that might support or contradict your decisions on what you think a standardized toolkit might look like or not.
if we look in the archaeological record there's a lot of antler pieces that look like napping tools that we use today and that's mainly what archaeologists go by if it looks like a napping tool it probably is a napping tool so they stick it over with the lithics take it away from the other parts of the assemblages separate them into the different piles this must be you know a tool for lithic reduction um, but you never know some tools might be used for more than one thing I've seen I've seen other items that look like napping tools like awls and hairpins and other types of pins made out of bone or antler even the uh, projectile points made from antler that look like they could be flit napping tools but I think they are projectile points or maybe they would interchange you know they just whatever you could use maybe they would improvise there's a there's many variables many many variables a whole lot of different conditions different traditions some are short-lived traditions some are very long traditions some Native Americans rediscovered and lost the technologies over time it wasn't a continuous technology I don't think I think sometimes they would lose the ability to flit nap certain styles just because a change in uh, hunting patterns change in environment perhaps a change in the accessibility to materials all that would influence the type of point you make but there are arguments that say no it doesn't really matter too much what material it's made of or anything else the shape is part of the culture and the culture trumps availability individuality all that stuff so no matter what the situation you're always going to make the same point even if it's different material even if you're rediscovering how to flint that because you're like the only one and you're learning from your elders but there's only a few elders that ever flint napped and some of them already forgot how to do it because they haven't done it in a while or your culture has switched mainly to agriculture all these things there's a there's pros and cons to every discussion and when I talk about things like this a lot of times I don't tell you this I'm talking about both pros and cons and it'll sound like I'm contradicting myself I'm just telling you the different angles the different uh, approaches the different circumstances etc okay so I would stop here as a preform it's a, still a little bit large I don't want to thin it down too much more I'd rather have too much than too little so I'm going to start shaping it according to what I think the shape was and I'm going to be making a Neolithic arrowhead Neolithic arrowheads we don't know exactly what tools they were using they may have been using copper or bronze to flit nap these things does it make a difference it it does yep yeah. it makes a difference because it's so much easier to produce consistent parallel flaking with a metal tool 
you can do it with natural tools don't get me wrong it's so much easier with a metal tool because you can just keep going and going it's like the energizer bunny the metal tool just keeps going and going and going you don't have to keep reshaping it every few minutes like if I use antler on this the lighting is poor if I use antler on this the obsidian is sharp enough to be wearing down the antler very quickly and I would have to do maintenance on it every few minutes you'll see I'll get back into the natural tool napping eventually you'll see the difference now can you harden antler can you harden bone can you make it so that it doesn't wear down as fast are there certain animals with more dense bones than others do you want dense bones or do you want not so dense bones and how do you tell a difference blah 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 I'll get into that kind of stuff because I'll be using different types of bone I think some of the densest bone that I've encountered is a pig bone or pork bone pork bone it seems to be very dense I've only made a couple tools out of pork bone but if they work it'll be good because they're cheap the pork bone dog chews very very cheap anyway I'll be getting into that I'll be getting into that eventually yeah, those flakes are flying into my hair They're flying across the room They're flying up into my face So much nicer so much nicer for pressure flaking but the edge has got to be a nice and well prepared and the surface needs to be clear as well <clears throat> Yeah, it is possible to get step fractures with uh, pressure flaking. I remember seeing a long time ago that an archaeologist was saying that there's very little chance of flint napping errors with pressure flaking compared to other styles of flaking. And I don't know, it just shows that not all of them have experience. Okay. Pressure flaking is very accurate, but you still have the same issues. Step fractures, overshots, all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> so this is just a matter of regularizing the edges, regularizing the surface. If it's a very delicate, fragile material, you've got to be very, very careful every step of the way. This is some of the most fragile obsidian of all, this, uh, this type of obsidian. I don't know, I don't know if it's silver sheen. Silver sheen has bubbles, right? I think. This one doesn't have bubbles in it. It just has that very silvery sheen to it. <laughs> it's not really silver. It's black with a, a shiny silvery sheen. Maybe that's not silver sheen. I don't know. It can get confusing with the names of the obsidian. So what I did was I regularized a bunch of areas. Now I'm going to do a few more thinning strikes to get it a little bit thinner. 
before I move into the final shaping. Now, in case you didn't know, there is an auction going on right now. Uh, it's not a live auction, it's just it's going to be sitting there until 9 p.m. Eastern for you to bid on the items. So check out the auction. See, I already got, when I brushed off those flakes, one of them got me. Just by using the brush to uh, brush off the flakes. Got me twice. Doot, doot. Ink. And I'm getting those in my shirt too. Anyway, I'm sure all you guys have experienced this. But the way I flint nap with indirect percussion, these these flakes go everywhere. And when I use a a domed pad, the flakes just bounce right off. I mean, if it's a slotted pad or a pad with a hole in it, the flakes will go down in the slot or down in the hole. But when you have a a dome to pad like this, especially with obsidian, these flakes just bounce and fly everywhere. But the results are worth it. If you're just very careful, you can get some really good results. All right, so I'm going to try to thin this down. By taking some choice indirect percussion flakes. here and there so nice obsidian can be really really nice and yes I'm using steel this is steel not aluminum you just gotta prepare the edge by making sure it's well ground but not too too much to ground down because if it's too ground down you'll need to strike way too hard and that's never a good thing on obsidian uh, one uh, one good thing I like about obsidian is the damage control is easy relatively easy if you have a step fracture in the middle of your piece your work piece getting rid of it is not that big of a deal compared to flint damage control with flint even the high quality stuff can be very challenging Yeah, taking bites out of it is one thing uh, you got to watch out for on a very strong platform. There's a balance there. If the platform is not strong enough, the flakes won't travel. If it's too strong, you'll get bites taken out. If you hit it wrong, <clears throat> the bites will be taken out as well. Yeah, I gotta be careful not to create islands in the middle. You can see how the, per the percussion flakes are nice and big, but they have a tendency to they have a tendency to be very chaotic. I gotta really focus. To make sure I'm not messing it up. Now, I'm not I'm not putting much pressure at all. There's hardly any pressure assist. 
just a little tiny bit. All right, it's starting to thin down. I'm getting step fractures, but I can take care of those. I think you can see there's a line of, there's a step line right there. I can get that from the other side, but I've got to trim the edge uh, first before I do it. Trim and turn the edge toward that side to run flakes to hit those steps from behind. Okay, next segment.